All right, so we're picking up pretty much where we left off last week in QGIS. Uh, last week we basically learned how to load uh, existing data layers into QGIS, how to pan and zoom and to click on the identify button and to get some information over here in the identify results panel that pops up. Um, and we loaded in our survey squares and our uh, previously digitized data from the field work that I did in like, uh, when was this, 2016, 17, something like that was my last field season there. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to learn a few more uh, techniques for interacting with existing data in QGIS. We're going to learn how to load in some base maps from uh, web sources using some plugins and then particularly of importance for uh, project one we're going to learn how to create a new vector layer and to digitize new features and again we're going to do this at a relatively basic level all of these things can be taken uh, much deeper uh, and if you continue on in GIS you're going to want to make sure you kind of go back and maybe read through some of the tutorials available on the QGIS website and uh, get a little bit of a deeper understanding but with what I'm going to show you this week you can pretty much do most basic digitizing tasks so firstly I provided a base map of our project region that I um, uh, acquired my own self through the Italian government some some number of years ago and these are uh, satellite images uh, of our region at pretty high res spatial resolution. If you don't have access to that kind of data set, and it can be expensive to acquire those, um, I showed you in the previous uh, video I linked about how to download data from the USGS, and unless you're working in the US getting high resolution imagery it, through them, it's, it's really not that possible. Basically, Landsat and Spot are two of your best bets, and they're not that high resolution. Luckily, there are some plugins in QGIS that you can tap into some, uh, I guess we would call them freemium, c commercially available streaming data sets. So things that you're used to, like Google uh, Earth imagery or Google Maps imagery or Bing Maps imagery and load them in as base maps and that is actually pretty convenient now there are a couple reasons why you might not want to use these as your base maps for digitizing um, uh, particularly about uh, making sure that CRS the projection information is exactly right and we'll see some issues with that but they are certainly convenient so the first thing I'm going to do is to show you how to install plugins and it's pretty easy there's a plugin menu up here and you just click on it and then go to manage and install plugins and a little dialog pops up over here now you can see um, well, I was already doing some searching in there so you can see you can look at plugins that you already have installed and the ones that have check marks on them are the ones that you have installed and that are uh, turned on at the moment and you have a few in here um, including eventually when we get to grass you can actually interface with grass through QGIS if you want to. Now there are some reasons why, why you might not want to and we'll get to that later in class. If you go to all you can see that there's a whole bunch of different plugins. I mean just a ton of them and you can click on any one of them and they give you some information about what they do um, and there's a bunch of stuff in here for doing you know more advanced analyses of different types but the ones that we're going to worry about today are adding base maps so we're just going to use the search bar base map uh, is how we're going to search. We're going to install two plugins. The first one is this HCM GIS and this is uh, a really kind of like a comprehensive base map uh, plugin. You're going to see that it has a lot of options. So it's very simple. Just hit install plugins. It will go up and grab them and install it. And the other one we're going to install is this one called Quick Map Services particularly to get OpenStreetMap data to, to load in, which is a, a useful thing to, to have for making uh, quick maps, you know, printable maps, etc., um, of different places in the world. So install plugin real quick, and then it's there. And you can see they have check marks on them, so they're good to go. Um, and also, you might have seen up here in the file menu, HCMGIS shows up over here. 
And if you want that to go away, you just can uncheck the box. Now that doesn't uninstall the plugin, it just makes it invisible. If you wanted to uninstall, you could uninstall here. And again, you, if there's an update, you would upgrade from the same menu as well. So let's first deal with HCMGIS and you click on the new file uh, interface at the top and you see there's a bunch of options. Really all we're interested in is the base map one and you can get Google Maps, Google Satellite, Google Sat Satellite Hybrid, Terrain, you can get Bing, then there's this something called Carto that taps into the Esri base maps. If you're familiar with those, uh, if you used Esri ArcGIS, these are the same deal. And there's some other ones here at the bottom including some Wikimedia, etc. Um, probably the two or the three most useful ones were going to be Google Satellite, Bing Virtual Earth, and then uh, Esri Imagery. Right? So if we just click on the Google Maps, you'll see it'll look like a Google Map, uh, you know, like a vector map. Um, and it adds it as a new layer over here. So again, it, it matters where it is. If you want anything to be above it, it's got to be the layer of Google Maps has to be below it. And we can remove that layer as we would remove any other layer. Um, but let's click on the satellite image uh, layer. And again, we'll put that underneath our one. And we can kind of zoom in. And you can see as you zoom in, you can get more and more higher resolution. And actually, it seems like it's overlaying pretty well in this particular area with our um, base map imagery that, uh, that that I provided for you. So here's a good test. Here's a structure outline that I did in the field. And it overlays perfectly on the imagery I provided. If we make our uh, regular uh, base map go invisible, and we kind of flip back and forth, we can see that there are some registration differences between the Google Maps satellite imagery and the satellite imagery that I provided to you. So, if you're going to use this as a uh, base map for digitizing, you just have to be aware that that's going to be an issue. Let's add in uh, another base map. Let's bring in the Bing map. And I'm going to make the Google's one invisible. It's already on the bottom anyway. And we're going to do the same thing. And you can see here the Bing is actually quite a bit off uh, uh, from our particular base map that we've been using. So Bing is probably not a good uh, base map for this part of the world, but in other parts it might be better. And then finally, since we're doing this test, let's go ahead and add in uh, the Esri imagery and we'll do the same thing and we'll see it's off in a different direction. So of these base maps, it looks like uh, the most, in, in our particular place for this area, the Google Satellite is going to be the best one if you need something supplemental to the imagery that I provided. Um, and it, this could be helpful because you can see there's a little bit of an improvement in resolution when we're looking at Google. And again, these other ones, even though they're not perfectly registered to all the other data sources, they might have imagery from a different time of year, and so it could be useful to have two or three different base maps there and to flip between them. But eventually when we want to trace the outline of a structure, we're going to want to make sure we have the base map I provided to you uh, as the visible base map that you're going to digitize around because that's the standard that we've basically been using, and we want to make sure everything aligns. So you don't want to be digitizing on top of five different base maps, you know, alternatively then nothing's going to line up, line up. As long as you're consistent, even if the base map is shifted relative to where things really are, it's relatively uh, unproblematic to just shift things back eventually if you need to. Right? As long as you're internally consistent and you're always digitizing on the same base map, then you can always move things around you know, uh, horizontally, vertically, or diagonally uh, if you want to later on. Um, so in terms of creating maps, which we're going to do later on, um, you can use these satellite base maps if you want, including Google Satellite. Um, but it might be nice to have a, a detailed, uh, just sort of more abstract view as well. And of course, you saw how I added in um, Google Maps. 
like so as a layer and you know it's it's whatever Google wants to give you in terms of the the streets that it shows shows some of them doesn't show all of them also there are some issues around copyright in using Google stuff in maps that you want to publish so uh, I'm going to remove that layer probably a better uh, solution is to go with an open data set and the other plugin we installed if you remember was a thing called quick map services and that shows up under this web menu quick web map services and there's basically two open data sets here that you can add in there's something from NASA which isn't particularly useful for us and then there's OpenStreetMap or OSM OSM standard and when we load that in as a layer put it down there at the bottom let me uh, make everything invisible we get the open street map base map for our area and you see you know it is what it is depending on where you are in the world there are some things that might be there and there are some things that might not um, if you're in a sort of more urban area there's a better chance that you're gonna have all the little streets and stuff in there and actually it's not too terrible for for um, this particular part of the world too there's some some roads that are on there that uh, you know might be useful to display so you know that's uh, maybe a little extra for what we're doing right now so I'm going to uh, remove the open street map at this particular moment and um, just wanted to show you that there, there is that uh, ability to add in um, some open base maps as well uh, but for now we'll turn our uh, two other base maps back on and at this point if we're happy with this base map here we can save our project and next time we open up our project plugin we'll call down the Google satellite base map and again you have to be connected to the internet it will load it back in as, uh, as a second base map that we can kind of flip back and forth when we're trying to identify features which is the main thing we're going to be trying to do when we digitize now before we get to that uh, I want to show you um, two other important ways to get information about features that already exist so I previously showed you how to use the identify tool to click on um, so you have to have the layer that you want to query highlighted to click on a feature and it briefly shows you by thickening the line which one it is and of course my lovely face is over the output window but this is all the data that we collected when we were in the field and there's there's a lot because we collected a lot of field data using tablets when we did our survey um, and this is fine if you want to go one by one and see the data in this kind of format but let's say you wanted to see all this information for all the features we previously digitized that's pretty straightforward you right click on the layer and this only works for vector layers because they're the ones that have databases or tables attached to them and then you find the uh, little item that says open attribute table over here in the menu that pops up and when you click it you see basically a spreadsheet this is the the data table that is attached to this uh, vector layer so every individual vector object which are line objects that you can see will have one row in the table and this is great so you can sort of just sort of go through and look at um, you know all of the data that you know exists in here and you can read read about it you can click on individual uh, things you can even copy the information out if you find something that you're interested in um, so there are a couple of ways that we can kind of go back and forth between this table and specific objects. So uh, one thing that we can do is just sort of randomly select a row and say we're interested in this particular row that is on this particular property. Um, we right click on it, we can click zoom to feature. And it zooms right in and selects it and shows it highlighted in yellow. If we didn't want to zoom, so let's um, uh, go back to the full oops because I have the Google satellite it's gonna it's gonna zoom all the way out to the earth so let's zoom into something like this and let me bring the table back up if I didn't want to zoom if I just wanted to let's say I enjoy I have a zoom level that I'm happy with if I just wanted to pan I can click pan to feature and it will center it on the screen so that's pretty useful as well 
Um, note that some of these tools uh, in the right click menu are also duplicated uh, up here where you can say zoom to the selected row or pan to the selected row. So if you like clicking buttons, those exist up here as well. Um, note that it highlights it in yellow. So the actual feature is now selected. And if we wanted to edit in uh, you know, any of the data, we could turn editing on. And now I can actually go in to any of these things. And I can actually, um, you know, I, in this particular case, I deleted wall height. But I'm going to write it back in there. <laughs> I could edit numbers if I wanted to in this table. And when I'm done, I would turn the editing mode off. And my changes would, would remain in there. Now, we might not want to do that for, for some of the data that I did. But when you're doing digitizing and you entered some information, you might want to go back and change that information. So that's an, a useful thing to actually know. Um, to get this to be unhighlighted, we can uh, click dis deselect all features here. We also have the same button over here in the, in the map window as well. So again, um, Let's say I clicked on this particular one, and uh, we can pan to feature. And you can see it's highlighted here in yellow. I could click over there, and it would deselect it as well. So that's pretty useful uh, in terms of navigating around. You can also do some sorting in here. Uh, there's some advanced selection. But let's say we wanted to uh, just sort of sort alphabetically by the use, like the type, original use. So we can just click here, and we can click A to Z or Z to A. And we can see all the different types uh, using the codes that are available in the, the Project 1 um, guide sheet that I provided to you. So you can easily see that and say, OK, what's a farmhouse? What does a farmhouse look like? select this guy, uh, pan to feature, and then, OK, this is what Professor Ula means when he's talking about a farmhouse. Um, I can't really see it on the San Pasquale base map, but what, what does it look like on the maybe higher resolution Google imagery? Oh, it's just like a little farmhouse. Uh, in this particular case, one that's not in very good condition. Um, these ones are in good condition. You can see the roofs are intact. And this one is in not very good condition with no roof. Um, It'd be kind of hard to know this if you didn't go out in the field that this was an old house. But you can make your best guess when you're doing digitizing from the satellite image. Um, the, the last little tool that I'll show you before we get into digitizing is the selection tool that is not based on the table. So I'm going to deselect here. You've got some selection tools over here. You can select by area or single click. You can select by uh, a query, which is something we'll get into a little bit later. And you can uh, select by putting in like an X and Y location if you wanted to. Um, probably the simplest one right now is to select features by area or click. So. If I do that, I can now click on different features. And you can see how they are highlighted. And you can also right click on something and hit Select Feature. If you want to select multiple features, you can click and drag a box. And it will select all of them. And as you do that, it will add to your previous uh, uh, selection. Now. You can uh, do this in a more complex way. You can draw polygons. You can do freehand uh, line, you know, like just draw a, a squiggly box around it, um, or any other way that you want. And uh, when you get the table, you will notice that the things that you have selected using these things show up highlighted. The rows show up highlighted in, in the table. So if we deselect again, and I go somewhere totally different. Um, I can just click on, let me just click on something a little bigger so you can see what I've done. This is a terrace wall. And I bring this up over here. Um, there is a little tool that says move selection to the top. 
and then you can go to the very top and there's your selected row uh, and if you click on something else let's click on that one uh, it will move that to the top as well okay so when you want that to go away that feature to go away you can un unclick this move selection to the top and it will show up you know wherever it was in the rows of the table so that's just useful for for you know figuring out you know information about specific features or specific groups of features as you select them um, you can do that and read the information in the table okay so at this particular point I think we're ready to talk about digitizing new data uh, you should pick a survey square it doesn't really matter which one you pick just pick one that you're kind of interested in and uh, then uh, what you're going to want to do is to digitize the outlines of the features that show up in um, you know the, the list of stuff that uh, we've been interested in in the area and what I'm going to want to do is to use a specific set of codes uh, that we have been using just so that everything and again this is good practice that everything uh, uses the same code the data we collected in the field the data you're going to do with your uh, base map survey here um, they'll all use the same codes and so if we wanted to join the data together the databases would have the same kinds of codes in them and we could do the, all the queries and everything and everything will work if you make uh, uh, changes to the codes that you use just know that it will break compatibility with anything you did before that particular point so uh, the way you do this is to go uh, to layer menu and create layer and then you have your choice of the data container now uh, there are a variety of different data containers but the three we're going to focus on, and you can choose how you're comfortable with it. You can choose the old school shape file. So if you're comfortable with those, you can choose that. Or you can choose a fancier new GeoPackage or Spatialite layer, which uh, have some advantages uh, in terms of the way they handle geometry and stuff. So let's just start with the old school shape file. And you'll see a new layer dialog will pop up. And the first thing you got to do is to pick a file name and you click on the little three dots and uh, if, you're, if it doesn't show up in your GIS projects folder navigate to it and then you can click into the SPV survey project and then click into the vector folder we're going to use our manual file tree and here you know depending on your computer operating system you'll see it slightly differently but you're going to want to make a new folder because shape files have multiple actual individual files and we'll call this um, new structures 2022 um, use something descriptive and you just made a new folder so you still need to make the file name and the best practice is to name it the same name as the folder name so that you know what the shape file is inside of it notice how I didn't use any spaces that's a convention that you should take on <laughs> when you're naming these things uh, it's a backwards compatibility thing because sometimes spaces and also dashes can cause problems in the names of files. So it's just a sort of thing, just don't use spaces, use underscores, don't use dashes, use underscores. That's how we do it, okay? And then you'll hit save there. Uh, oh, no such file or directory. Give me one second. Pause for the comment. Okay, while I was chatting, I accidentally clicked on something and it put a bunch of text up here in the name dialog that shouldn't have been there. So you can see I'm still in Vector New Structures 22 is the folder I just made. And now I want to call the file also New Structures 2022. So you can see the only thing in the name dialog is that. And when we hit save, it does it. So this is going to be our new shape file. And the geometry type uh, here, we should pick line string. And that's just a, a, a vector type for lines. And I'm going to show you a, a little file, um, sorry, a little um, a graphic about 
this in a minute when we get to the more fancy spatial light, etc., that we can choose. Note here that we have the CRS. We could choose a different one, but the project CRS is this uh, 4326 and uh, WGS84. And, uh, you know, without getting into too much detail, we just don't want to change that. We want everything to be in the same um, projection system. And, uh, oh, look at this. My office hours are coming up. Go away. And then we're going to want to add our two fields. And if you look at the uh, Project One description, we have uh, one that should be text data, and it should be called condition, all lowercase. And the length should be 10 characters. And again, with shape files, they're older, so you really have to be, they only give you a certain character limit. And um, choosing a smaller limit, if, if you're using codes that aren't more than 10 characters, means the file size is going to be smaller. So that's something that we want to do. So once we have that set up, we add to fields list, and you can see the conditions there. By the way, it already has this ID field that's just a factor of all shape files have that ID field in there. The next one we're going to want to put in is a, a, a field named type and we're going to want that to be a whole number or an integer and we'll leave it at 10 even though technically I, actually I think I said 3 because we're not going to have more than uh, you know 999 features in your little square and again the smaller number you put here the smaller the file will actually be and it's not too huge of a deal these things are not going to be massive files so don't worry about that and you can see there we have our two fields added and we'll click OK and it automatically loads it in for us here in the layer manager but also over here under project home vector we have now new structures 2022 and we can see our shape file here okay uh, we're gonna also uh, in this particular case uh, I'm going to show you spatial light and geo package is fairly similar to spatial light, although they're each a little bit different in the dialog that you see here. And uh, again, three dot menu, GIS projects, SPV survey, vector, and here we're going to call this uh, new structures. Spell it right. Twenty twenty two. Spatial light. I'm just uh, doing that so I can tell the difference between the two. Hit save. And now a spatial light is a database structure, so you have to give a layer name. There can be multiple layers inside a spatial light. And same thing with a geo package. So they're, they're useful uh, because you can containerize multiple different vectors. And in geo package, you can also do rasters as well. But let's call this. Uh, New structure, structures, lines, okay, structures. And the geometry type, now we have line string, but we also have multi-line and multi-polygon, multi-point and point. So you're going to choose line string, and the reason why, if I can get over to my web browser, is that it is backwards compatible. It's a simple feature where each line feature is just a single um, line object. So here we have the endpoints and we have the vertices. And each one of these, whether it crosses over, whether it connects back, is going to be an individual object. And it can be composed of only one line with two endpoints. The endpoints can overlap with each other or they can be independent, right? A multi-line string can be composed of multiple individual lines, so you have multiple endpoints. This can be useful for doing like road networks and that kind of stuff, but for what we're doing here, it's actually not necessary. I mean, we could do it if we really wanted to, and it adds a layer of complexity that we don't necessarily need to deal with at this particular level. Just know that if there is something that you want to digitize where it would be convenient to do it like in one of these uh, styles where you can have multiple independent lines you can do that in spatialite you can't do that with a shape file right and you can also do this with a geo package as well 
So we're going to pick just the line stream because what we're doing is fairly simple and it also has the benefit of keeping it kind of backwards compatible if you ever wanted to save this out in future as a shapefile, for example. You can do it and you won't have any unexpected results. If you did it as a multi-line string and you saved it out as a shapefile, then all of those things you think are one object are going to break apart into multiple objects and that can be kind of messy if you're trying to go back uh, backwards compatible. Okay. So, basically we're here at the same uh, place. We can put our conditions field in. It's text data. We don't have to worry about character amounts in Spatialite, so that's good. Add to fields list, and then we can put our uh, type. And I think I did this backwards, actually, so let me remove the condition field. Type should be text data, and condition should be the whole number uh, and there they are now under advanced options you can see it's going to make a geometry column a key uh, and that's okay uh, it's useful to have each feature have its own uh, sort of auto incrementing primary key so that it can have this individual number so we're just going to leave that alone we're going to click okay so let's take a look at this. We have our new structures lines and over here we have our new structure spatialite and in that we have our new structures uh, lines uh, file, uh, so sorry, layer and that's what is over here. And then we also have here our new structures 2022 which was the shape file that we uh, also created. Now these are both blank, there's no data so you can't see anything. Um, when you want to add information, you are now going to be digitizing. So you're going to be tracing features that you can see in the imagery. So again, we're looking at the Google Satellite base map and we have our Pasquale Orthophoto base map. And when we want to go to do digitizing, we can flash back and forth these. But when, again, when we want to do the outline, let's just stick with the Orthophoto base map so that everything is consistent. So let's start with the shape file. I'm going to highlight it here in the layer menus and then I'm going to go up here and you'll see this little button that says toggle editing. It looks like a pencil. So click it and you'll see a few other tools have now become available. Uh, in particular because this is a line vector file it has this add line feature and that's our main tool that we're going to use to trace over things. So I'm going to click it and now you'll see my um, mouse cursor has turned into a crosshairs. So I have a building here. It looks to me uh, with my trained eye like a farmhouse. And again, there's a link in the project uh, uh, description file to actually some field photos. So if you really want to see what these things look like on the ground, you can get a sense of it, right? And I like this as a single house. I want to start tracing it. So I'm going to click my left mouse button and you can kind of probably barely see this little very faint red dash line is is uh, trailing behind where I just clicked and where I am now so I'm just gonna click on the different corners and every time I click the last segment is gonna solidify into a solid red line and you know you can be as uh, detailed as you like about this and it's pretty straightforward in these fairly rectilinear geometric shapes to just click on the corners and when I'm done I don't know if you can see that uh, wherever my mouse cursor goes I still have that dash line so I could click another line over here a uh, point over here if I wanted to but when I want to finish the feature I use the right mouse button and it pops up this a hey, add some information into the table so shape files unfortunately the ID number you have to remember you know you have to increment it yourself um, there is a plugin that can auto increment for you but right you got to remember at least what you were doing beforehand here, if you'll remember, I accidentally transposed condition and type. So uh, this should be, this text one should be type, and we would put F house, which is the code. And again, you can go back to the project file and look up the codes. And condition, uh, again, in the project file, you're going to want to look and see, ah, this one has a roof. It's probably still in use, so we're going to give it the code one for, uh, for condition. And again, remember, I accidentally transposed these names. So we're going to just type 1 over here and click OK. And there is our outline. And again, if we want to change the um, 
the style of it, we can go back uh, to the properties dialog, go to the symbology tab here, line, simple line, and we can increase the thickness of it and we can see it a little bit easier, okay? So we can continue on, we can do uh, a new feature and uh, you know we don't know what this outlying structure is but let's say we think it might be a barn. So I'm doing the same thing, I clicked all around it and when I'm done I hit the right click and now we have to type in 2 for the ID uh, and the, remember it says condition but this should be type so I'm just going to put barn, this is what I'm guessing it is and type again it has a roof but it doesn't maybe look quite as good so I'm going to put condition 2 and click OK and now if I want to I can open the attribute table and I can see my two features that I've digitized are right here and uh, same deal I showed you before you can highlight them like so and you'll notice that the vertices are shown here because we're still in editing mode and that's useful because if I want to, I can go back here and click on this tool right here, which is the vertex tool. And I can click and drag and move the vertices around after the fact. So I'm just clicking it once and now it's sort of attached to my mouse cursor and I can move my mouse cursor around. And when I left click again, it puts it back in place. And... Uh, if I wanted to, I could add a new one between them, and you can see how I added it in between, and uh, I can move that around as well, right? Uh, okay, so let me click and drag that back. There we go. And when I'm done editing, I can hit the Save button here. Now, if I go to Project and hit Save, it'll save the, the layers, but it will not save any changes I made into the geometry of any layer that I've been editing. So you have to click this. But let's say I don't like this last couple things that I did. I can roll back and it deletes everything until the last time I saved. Uh-oh. That's, that's trouble, right? So you want to make sure you know what you're doing when you do this kind of thing. So now I have to go back and actually add all of this stuff again and uh, make sure that I add in all the right information blah 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 right uh, here to the to the thing so I want to make sure I'm saving a lot as I go along because if I save now like so and now I go to add in another feature and you know uh oh I made a mistake I don't know what this is I can actually hit the roll back and it will just delete everything back into the last point that I saved that's a super handy thing but if you don't do it right and you don't save often, you're going to be in trouble, okay? And now, when I'm completely done, I can stop editing by uh, hitting the toggle edit button again. And now my editing tools are all grayed out, okay? So, uh, for something like Spatial or Geo Package, it's largely the same deal. We select that uh, layer over in the left menu. We collect the editing toggle. I mean, we click the editing toggle again and we have the same basic uh, tools so now I can let's just say I want to trace over this road I can do that and again I can click as many times as I want to make the geometry smoother or less smoother and I can be as detailed as I want as I follow this road and I can zoom out if I wanted to um, and I can sort of pan over in the middle of this and, uh, and click back on my editing tools and keep going right and uh, let's just see, I'm happy with that for now. So now the benefit of doing this, one of the benefits is I don't have to enter in the ID number. It's going to automatically increment it for me. And here I'm going to put, uh, I'm going to go back to look at my codes and uh, find what I should call this P road for paved roads or D road for dirt road. So this looked to me like a dirt road. So I'm going to call it. D road and uh, I had cap locks enabled so let's <laughs> turn that off and the condition looks good to me so I'll hit one right click OK boom and again with this if we wanted to um, we can go to the properties and we can go line simple line and make it a little thicker so we can see it better we can change the color if we wanted to but anyway there's 
there's our uh, dirt road over here and it's pretty much the same deal from there uh, we could go in and we could move the vertices around we, we would like to save our edits and we would like to toggle the editing on and off that way so whichever format you choose whichever container you choose it's up to you um, but you're going to want to know that there are slight differences between them and there are some drawbacks and benefits from doing it one or the other. My personal preference would be to use either Spatialite or GeoPackage, um, knowing that there may be some compatibility issues with other software or if you want to roll back to something older. Um, but I think the, the benefits that those data containers give you in terms of um, modern geometry and some convenience factors like the auto-generating ID numbers are probably uh, useful. And again, as long as we're doing this as a regular line string, we can always right-click on this guy and um, this, is the, this is the spatial light, right? I can right-click on this and uh, where is it? Hit export, save features as, and if I want to, I can change, check, pick any feature uh, container that I'd like, including shapefile which is somewhere in here if I can look at it yeah, Esri shapefile right there right in front of my name and I can click it out over here and I can even overwrite our new structures.shp that we already put in here so let's do that why not and click OK oh now we'll give you a warning to overwrite something that already exists and we did it so um, there we are, I guess. Uh, basically, that's digitizing in a nutshell and a couple of basic um, feature selects and a little bit of like spatial querying by using our, our little, um, you know, identify by bounding box area, uh, tool over here. Um, next week, we'll get a little bit more fancy with QGIS and some of the other things that it can do.